Oh my, I hope this works. I hope this works. I hope this works. Hey, you guys, I finally got and installed a ring light so you can see me a little better. Not so much now because I'm sitting here in front of my picture window with light streaming in. But I was testing it to make sure it works today. This is more important on those nights where I'm torturing Nigerian romance scammers. That's really what it's for. So I'm just going to use it for now and see, <laughs> see how I like it. I want to talk today about a book that I didn't even know existed until recently. It's by Debbie Pearl. It's called The Vision. It's Debbie Pearl's attempt to write fiction. And it comes across as kind of like, hey, Bossy22, it comes across as a, what would you say, like a Mary Sue. It's a fundamental, it's Fundy Town's Mary Sue with some of the most ridiculous plot lines I've ever seen. First, I need to explain who Debbie Pearl is because I know not my entire viewing audience has any idea who Debbie is. Debbie is the wife of Michael Pearl. Michael and Debbie Pearl reside in rural Tennessee. They have a ministry they've run for years. Michael is another one of those guys that won't work. He does, he preaches. That's how he supports them. And they've told tales of having to eat dog food or cat food and having to grind their own grain and just all kinds of poverty kind of beyond, like if they were like in the 1800s. So they do that a lot. They um, have a ministry called No Greater Joy. No Greater Joy Ministry. They teach about marriage. They teach about children. And the biggest thing they teach about is children. They also have a magazine called No Greater Joy. Michael Pearl's child discipline manual is called um, To Train Up a Child. To Train Up a Child. And it's a horrific, it's a very horrific thing. It talks about beating your children. According to Michael, you have to, you have to beat them to let them know your boss and that you're serious every time you speak so that they will do smiling obedience every time you beat them till you break their will. He advises using one quarter inch plastic plumbing pipe on your children. He advises starting as young as six months by putting your child in the middle of a blanket, putting toys around just out of the child's reach. And when the child reaches for the toy, you say no and you smack them with whatever implement you're going to use. I mean, it's pretty horrific, I think. It's a manual for child abuse. There have been at least four deaths I know of, maybe more, where the manual was actually cited and seen sitting out. And the people were like, but we followed Michael's advice. If you have a few hours to kill, go over to NoGreaterJoy.org and read through the backlog of stories in their magazine, No Greater Joy magazine. Some of the stuff they say is just, I mean, beyond horrific. Debbie doubles down with the abuse, too, because she has a nonfiction book she's written called Created to Be a Helpmeet, and she's had a bunch of others spin off from that. Talks about being a wife. She um, puts down people by calling them hillbilly ugly and all kinds of just crazy stuff. The biggest thing that I object to in her book is when you handle your husband's essay of, to, of the children. She said, if your husband does that, you turn him into the police, but you're supportive of him. You bring the children to see him in prison. You stick by his side during the trial. You um, you just support him in every way. You put money on his prisoner account, the whole nine yards. And when he gets out of prison for having done SA to a child, you place your children elsewhere and you welcome him with op open arms. There's no option for divorce in her world, even though I can honestly say in my old quiverful toxic church, our pastor actually got somebody who... Um, was a uh, child abuser who had abused his child in a pretty horrific way. One of the two, we got that. He got that woman to uh, to divorce her husband. He had to give her permission and say, you know, it's it's a okay if you want to divorce him. You don't have to stay married to the man. And um, that was kind of a newsflash for her. So anyway, back to this book. This book is written by an abuser, 
no doubt about that in my mind. Because when Debbie tells stories in No Greater Joy magazine and other things, she talks about scaring people in the bathroom, all sorts of things like that that are not loving, not really Jesus-oriented. And her husband's always talk about beating somebody, beating a child, beating a dog, beating a cat, beating his wife's stupid roosters. He really is obsessed with proving his masculinity to everyone. Well, this book is a Debbie Pearl bodice ripper with every bad idea that Debbie ever had is mixed up in this. One of those worst ones, even though she doesn't talk about beating people, thank God, is the entire book is Islamophobic. It's about a ministry much like her and her husband's in the same part of the world they're in, and it's run by an older couple, and they have a daughter named Cheyenne, and they're trying to put together these books, God's Story, and these God stories are in the same sort of format you see on, let me grab them, I got them, I got them. Chick Tracks, the exact same format as Chick Tracks. A cartoon that tells everybody they got to bow to Jesus or go to hell. These things are so fear-mongering, it's ridiculous. But I do collect them. They are bizarre. They're bizarre. Um... So I'm setting that up. They're small town. They have a large Arabic Muslim population moved to that town. They're a little tiny town in the middle of nowhere where the Debbie character is calling locals hillbillies. Nice touch there. And saying that all Muslims are evil. The whole book revolves around some plot with Muslims trying to shut them down because they're trying to get their story of God books into the hands of the Muslim population. Okay, so I have to read you this quote directly from the book because when I read this, I was just shaken up. It's like I can't believe that they're talking, thinking like this. Think about it, Magdalene. People like us, the non-Muslim community, are scared to stand against anything Islam demands. So laws get changed without effort. Newscasters neglect to tell the entire story. School textbooks are changed to include Islamic teaching. Officials give over to Muslim holidays and all the many other things that immigrants change in a community when they move to a new area. They let terrorists help them take control, even while fear controls them. Oh, so she's talking about fear in the Islamic and she's talking about Muslim terrorists hijacking the planes and running them into the Nile to into the World Trade Center during 9/11. This was um, this was written right around the time of 9/11, shortly thereafter. And I think that that played a huge part for Debbie. But here's where it gets comical for me because. I've known Muslims. I've worked with Muslims. I've had Muslim neighbors. I, I have Muslim followers on social media because I've stood up for them a number of times when you get these, these types uh, that believe all immigrants are bad. They're not bad. They're just like us. They just want to be in a safe place and be able to raise their families in peace to support everybody. It's not at all like what Debbie's saying where it's Muslim terrorists every moment in a stupid book. Um, to judge all Muslims by the actions of the Taliban or, is, or ISIS is the same as judging all Christians by um, Westboro Baptist or Stephen Anderson's weird little cult. Speaking of which, the other pastor in that weird little cult that I was talking about yesterday, whose name I totally forgot, is in Steadfast Church in Texas. <clears throat> he... Um, He's now attacking other people. He's trying to say that um, Pastor Jimenez, I think that was it, ex-wife stole all the money. He didn't do it. So he's coming up with that, and that's pretty ridiculous, I think. He um, He's blaming everybody but himself. And here I am again forgetting that it is name. I know it. I know it. I know it. But I can't remember right now, but he is in the Texas Steadfast Church, Baptist Church. 
he just posted a video on YouTube where he talks about how everybody stole his money but him. He's not stealing money. The day I believe that is the day that I'm going to buy the book Brooklyn Bridge. <laughs> I don't believe it. I believe that he probably has done some funny baloney with money. That's one of the reasons that I tell people when you leave your old cult church, go to a more mainstream church that has oversight, that has regional, state, and national oversight. It may not be as exciting. You may not have as much charismatic experience or whatever, but they're not going to be able to walk off with the money and spend it on bongs or hookers or whatever it is they do. Now, Jimenez, when he was kicked out, that's what he'd spent money on, I think it was. Was it Donnie Romero? I'm sorry, Romero. I'm sorry. See your moments. Donnie Romero was the one. And his ex-wife recently came out of the woodwork to tell tales on him, too. So it's it's pretty crazy some of the things that have happened and things have been said. As much as I am not a fan of Jimenez, he didn't do any of that, as far as I know. So I'm not going to... So I'm correcting myself right now, and I'm not going to go there. So anyway, long story, Muslim people are hated in this book. The main thrust of the book is about how this Debbie and Michael Pearl type couple with their large ministry sending out all these God's Word comic books and being harassed by Muslims that actually bombed something in their community to get to Deb to get to the pseudo Debbie and pseudo Mike. Um, so they have just painted them black all the way through, including having the FBI show up because they're concerned about Muslim terrorist activity in that little tiny community. Good grief. So the other big plot point is that the Debbie alike has made this um, what did she call it? Go back a little bit. I know what I would call it. Okay. Oh, I got to read some more Muslim parts. The Quran teaches just the opposite. Islam asks believers, are you willing to kill and die for Allah? Are you willing to bring harm to those who who are your friends? Will you misuse those who do you good, even those you do love? Would you, for Allah's sake, kill your own beloved child? Then Islam helps the believers go through with those evil deeds by teaching them to fear, not to obey. I don't know. This is getting, where's my air conditioning remote? This is getting all too crazy. And you got to excuse the mess. I've been organizing today. I've been taking apart all my organizers and, and cleaning and, and taking expired things out. I had something rupture in my suitcase that ruined my carry-on that I have my little toiletries in, so I had to clean that mess up too. So I haven't put anything away. So Debbie Pearl alike, pseudo Debbie Pearl, invents this elixir. I guess that's what the word I'm going to use. This elixir, this syrup made from boiling berries, basically boiling berries, um, all kinds of different berries, putting them in a pot with water, boiling them, and also putting some magical leaf in there that is from some plant in, I guess it's, is it Iraq or Iran that the uh, that they now think that the Garden of Eden is in? I think it's Iraq, Iraq, and some special plant that only grows there. So she's saying this elixir She's making this elixir. She's saying it. She's fermenting it for days and days and days on end for months, saying that it's going to you know, heal everybody in the world. She gives it to her husband, Mike. Mike-alike, I'm going to call him, because he's called a ridiculous biblical name, the Mike-alike. She gives him some, and he recovers from a stroke miraculously and other things. And he's sharper and harder working than any 20-year-old. Her dog gets stomped to death by an evil wrongdoer, and she gives her dog the elixir, and it, it brings him back to life. Even though he has been stomped to death and is bloody and has all these open, gaping wounds, her fermented berry juice brings him back. 
The reason I find that so incredibly and utterly ridiculous is I started thinking about it when I reread the book during my um, recent vacation. The thing that is so comical about this is that this fermented berry juice, I started thinking about it. When I was a kid, one of the things my father did was he made wine and I would help him. He would make, he made crazy wine. He'd get peach pits and leftover peaches and make peach wine. He, and, and peach brandy sort of thing, he would do that. He would get um, strawberries or cherries and make wine out of them. The only thing like that I've done is I put cherries in vodka and had vodka cherries. Those are really good. He made all these wines, even from dandelions. He'd make dandelion wine. So listen, and I'm, I'm reading this stupid thing, and I'm talk, hearing her talk about her fermented berry mixture. It sounds very, very close to what my father used to make when he would make brandies and wines and different Weird things like cherry bounce, he'd call it the one thing he made with cherries. And they were all really delicious. Well, I started thinking about that. Her miracle berry juice is fermented. It's wine. No wonder you think it cures everything. Because for people that think that drinking is evil and wrong are actually drinking. They're drinking this fermented juice. In the very back of the book, she gives a recipe for a similar juice as the one that the lady in the book is, has put it together. But the similar juice that's all put together has this special leaf from the Garden of Eden. So we've got that a little ridiculous going on. You also have a bodice ripper type romance between some dude named Asher and uh, the faux Debbie's daughter who has the name of Cheyenne. All the names of this book are just utterly ridiculous. They're straight out of romance novels. You cannot convince me that Debbie Pearl at one point did not sit around and read romance novels. And I was laughing hard earlier going back through some of the parts because they were having stuff happen like Asher took Cheyenne's hand and she started talking about the electricity, the sparks that were shooting through them and how she knew he loved her in that moment because of the electricity she was feeling through her hand. Now, well, I know that um, I know that chemistry between people and even electricity like that is possible. I mean, it happens. You're not going to hook up with somebody you have no chemistry with. But there's no no essential spark there. So she takes it to this really strange place, <laughs> and the whole book is longing glances, clasped hands. Oh my goodness. They take a girl off the street who's who was working as a prostitute and teach her how to do herbs because Cheyenne is doing the same thing that one of Debbie Pearl's daughters did, which is to buy and dry herbs and sell them as the be-all, cure-all. And look, I'm not putting down herbal medicine. Herbal medicine has its place. It's really good. It's very helpful, but it's not all that. I'm just going to say it doesn't cure everything. And that's me talking with some kind of infection right now who's taken 10,000 milligrams of garlic every four hours. Because for me, that seems to work just as well as going and getting a prescription for an antibiotic. So I'm, I'm not entirely opposed to that. I am entirely opposed to when people say that it's way better all the time than doctor's medicines and it'll cure everything. It doesn't cure everything. It can help. But when you start making claims about it that aren't substantiated by anything, you really have problems. It can really get people in some very sad situations. I've seen that in my old church. Earlier today, I was talking on um, a Facebook group, uh, That's Enough Ping Drink, about when a friend of mine cheated on her husband through this church. And everything that went down, and then at the end, he forgave her, even though she was still running around cheating. This woman did not believe in any kind of any kind of medicine whatsoever, any kind of doctors. She said it was idolatry, right up until she got a migraine that wouldn't lift. 
went to the ER and they found that she had uterine cancer that spread all over her body. It was in her brain. It was everywhere. They gave her two weeks to live, just a mere two weeks. And um, she died. Her husband did like so many other guys in this particular evangelical, quiverful kind of world. Bought a fancy new car, got a fancy newer, younger wife model. And he seems pretty happy. He was miserable with his original wife, but he would not divorce her, even though she kept running around. So because she didn't get regular pap smears or even didn't go to have something simple like, you know, most of us at least go to the doctor every now and then and have our cholesterol checked. We have, uh, you know, our blood pressure checked, which I check my own here frequently because of my stroke. I really need to keep an eye on my blood pressure and keep a tight lid on it. So she did none of that. She didn't take vitamins. She believed only in herbal medicine. So when they found her cancer, it was so advanced, there was no hope. And I was really saddened by that because if you get regular checkups, a pap smear would have caught that at a stage where chances are they could have stopped it. So that's one thing I hate about quiverful evangelicalism is that so many of the people don't believe in any kind of medicine whatsoever and they die. They die. I'm lucky my husband didn't die because he was being told the same thing. Turned out he had a, a parathyroid cancer and they took that out and he's been fine since but i got tons of tons of pushback and bullshit for that so back to the book so the book also says well we're living there in east tennessee so that we can avoid the giant super volcano under under yellowstone that's getting ready to blow because that's one of the other subplots and that's why they're stockpiling herbs they're stockpiling their miracle cure and they're just doing all kinds of stuff. And it's them against a hostile world. The book, the book came out, I think, in 2001 or two. It was not too far after 9-11 it came out. So it came out when the crisp, well, when evangelical fundamentalist critical decided that all Muslims were terrorists. That's when the book came out. And it really plays into that. It's poorly written. All the plot lines are all over the place. They rescue this girl. She joins up with them and starts wearing a skirt down to her ankles and uh, becomes suddenly modest. There's all kinds of shade thrown at immoral women. Uh, there's some very bad words used to describe them. Every people group that Debbie Pearl comes up against in this book that is not in her little circle of... Uh, Fear, her little circle of fear that um, she's operating in, or her, her alter ego is operating in. She has a denigrating setting for that, that people group, every single one. Now, she does write a righteous black man into the plot, so I'll give her props for that. But everything else, Hispanics, Muslims, hillbillies, not my word. And other groups, she just really puts them down. So they're stockpiling this for this Armageddon of these Muslim attacks and for the the volcano blowing. Whoremongers, that's another one that you see in here. Whoremongers. Ah, so after I start reading the book, and at the end, everything comes true and they're righteous and they get their books out. They get all their potion made. They have some of it imported from China. And so long story short, they emerge victorious over it all. So I had to look up some of the things they were talking about. It's insisting we're soon to happen. One of them is the volcano under Yellowstone. There is a volcano over Yellow, under Yellowstone. She wasn't exaggerating about that. I, I'm not real surprised because... When you visit Yellowstone National Park, you know, they've got Old Faithful, the geyser of superheated water that comes up on schedule. There's lesser geysers there. There's all kinds of hot water pools that you have to be careful of. I was reading one time about all these people that have died since then because they won't, don't want to stay on the path or maybe they accidentally fall in. And it's pretty horrific. 
So I would assume that any place that has those kind of hot water things and has geysers is going to have a volcano underneath. So the volcano is even less likely to erupt than what she's saying here. Volcanologists keep an eye on this thing. There are all kinds of different instruments they use to, to register the activity there. And the activity there is rather low. It's not high like what she's saying here. It's not likely. In fact, I saw something the other day where they said it was not likely to blow for anywhere from between 100 and 1,000 years from now, long after all of us will be gone. And they think it's more like the 1,000 based upon the seismic readings. So she's wrong on everything in this book. She's wrong on Muslims. She's wrong on climate change and volcanoes. She's wrong that you can treat everything in the world with berries and some leaves. It's just, and it's all of their ridiculous religious fear-mongering in this. It's a fear-mongering book. It's all about standing up against those that will kill you because you're a Jesus freak. That's the entire book. It, um, like I said, there's not a group of people that they didn't hate on. And let me see real quick. There's something else I wanted to bring up. Oh, they're talking about how she converted her Muslim friend before the parents killed her as a honor killing because she had looked at Jesus. She looked at the little book. Okay. One of the gals had an abortion and they make her extremely regretful of her abortion and crying and crying and crying for her, her lost child, Starlight. She had a abortion. So there's abortion fears too there. And uh, Malachi is the name of the, um, is the name of the Michael alike and Hope is the name of the Debbie alike. Like I said, some of these names give me pause. By the end of the book, they've matched off all the unmarried girls with righteous men to marry, except for one that runs off with somebody else, for one that runs off with somebody else. It's bad. Well, I'll show. Okay. Wow, for a change, you're not. <laughs> Noel with an E. Okay. You know something? I was done talking about her until she had me serve that stupid email. And I'm not going to talk about her anymore. The hell with her. And I have done other content where I don't talk about her. So if you are here just to bitch about that, guess what I'm going to do? Block your ass. You're here to have a conversation, a legitimate conversation. That's one thing. But this, that's, that's, I'm not, I'm not tolerant to that at all right now okay so i'm losing my voice entirely oh so they're telling her that jesus will restore her to her aborted baby and she'll get to raise him in heaven uh, they talk about a whole lot of really ridiculous things in here like chewing planted leaves and putting it on bug bites after you chew it up i wouldn't do that it might work, but there are a lot of other things that work better on bee stings than that. Huh, so, oddly enough, Malachi Michael is not abusive in this book. He's too busy going out there and preaching to the masses to, to be beating children or talking about beating children. There's no reference to that given anywhere in the book. Now, there are references to various people groups, like I said. There's also the worst Boston accent I've ever seen <laughs> in the book, where it sounds more like a Southern accent that she's talking about. The real crazy of the book, I'm trying to get to it. The real crazy of the book is the last section where she is linked to, to news articles about all these horrible things she's seeing happen. Muslims changing laws, Muslims forcing their way on everybody else. Okay, here's some Catholic, beating up on the Catholics. <sighs> beating up on the Catholics, the whole nine yards. So the last part of the book is just links to all these different conspiracy theories. 
conspiracy theories about everything from the volcano exploding to Muslims taking over. I'm calling Muslims because my friend Cindy and I have laughed about that because when I have defended Muslims online, I have gotten crazy pushback. I've been called filthy games. Um, it's just pretty crazy, some of the things I've seen. And it's sad. Do you remember when Jill sent her oldest stars live with the pearls for a summer? They came back looking healthier and stronger. They put on a couple of pounds and just look so healthy. Well, see, I do. That happened. I remember seeing that and seeing the article that was written by them at, oh, what's the name of that? With No Greater Joy. They actually wrote an article there that was posted in the magazines. It looked so much healthier. For all the pearls, the things I dislike about them, one of the things that seems to be a given with them is that they actually take care of those girls. They take real good care of the girls that come in and work for them. They feed them. They give them a place to stay. It may not be the most luxurious of accommodations. And they have them help out with the publications and the other things, the books they sell. So they give the girls a decent outlet and they get some free, <laughs> they get some, they get some free, 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 free labor out of the deal. And that's maybe not too bad. You know, I can't really say anything about that because both my son and daughter <laughs> served internships, unpaid internships before they got the job they have, their jobs. It just happens. Oh, Bo, yeah, it's a really interesting book, but it's a really scary book to know how much she she thinks these things. The thing with Doug Wilson's books, the two I did before, the uh, the Man in the Dark and uh, the Crazy Robot Sex one, is he was just so over the top crazy. It read almost like some, a parody of what you would think religious people would think. So um, the foreword of the stupid book, Debbie wrote that this was going to be one in a series of many books. It was called The Last Publisher Series because that's the name of the ministry that this fictional Malachi and Hope have. It's The Last Publisher's Ministry because apparently in Debbie Town, they've already made it illegal to publish the Bible and Christianity and all that crap. So it's a lot of martyr baiting going on, too. It's mixed up with a lot of martyr baiting and the thought patterns of these people the conspiracy theories that they believe in over common sense blows my mind. It blows my mind because I actually knew people like this. I knew people who used their books the first time. Well, not the first time. I got I to gotta go forward from that. When I went to my new church, when I joined the Quiverful Church, Quiverful Evangelical Fundamentalism, it was a non-denom. I joined it, like I've said before, in the middle of a crisis, a health crisis with my youngest. A mystery disease that nobody seems to know much about even today. So there was that. So I joined at the hardest time of my life and they love bombed me. Well, after my daughter came out of the hospital, after I don't know how many times, her and I would cling on each other. We would just, we would just be like this all the time. Why? Well, because we'd both been through a really traumatic event. So we were hugging on to each other. And after a few months of that, somebody at the church gave me to train up a child. And they criticized me. They told me and said, your child is way too clingy to you. Okay. 